Hello everyone, this is Christine from Greenbook. Welcome to this Grit Forum breakout session brought to us by AYTM. Today, your moderator is Eileen Rozick. Bring her back up on screen and she is joined by a team of panelists here. Go ahead, Eileen. Great. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we are here for our leader roundtable, focusing on the buzz topics section of the upcoming GRIT report. Um, we are AYTM, which is Ask Your Target Market, an online technology company focusing on automated insights for our global customers. And I'm Eileen Rozick. I uh, lead our client and sales initiatives at AYTM, and I have some amazing experts with me today to uh, share their knowledge with you. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, and first off, we have Lev. Hi, everyone. Lev Mason, CEO and co-founder of AYTM. Great. And then uh, the wonderful Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Vance, VP of Research here at AYTM. And Rosie. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosie Dubrikova, and I'm the director of panel operations at AYTM. Wonderful. So uh, we got together today because we wanted to share with everybody um, the section of buzz topics within the GRIT report. And buzz topics are really about what's hot and what's next. Um, we've gone through a lot in insights uh, always, but definitely this year. And I think we've even become uh, more powerful and important to our customers. So we um, selected some hot topics from the buzz topics. We wanted to share um, our expertise and industry knowledge with you. So first off is um, one of the number one buzz topics was methods and sampling. Um, that's everything from fraud and transparency to quality and confidence. And um, I'm gonna start with uh, Rosi. How do you find in methods and sampling, um, your ex expertise with sampling and respondent experience, how does that affect data quality? Thank you, Eileen. Uh, well, this is actually a wonderful question um, because when done right, data quality is actually an end-to-end -end process that also uh, includes the survey respondent experience. And uh, I think the question of how to better understand, measure, and uh, reduce respondent burden is really crucial, particularly in an era of increased use of um, mobile devices for survey completion. So high data quality collection starts obviously with a well-written questionnaire, optimal survey design, but also correct sampling criteria. So we have to ask ourselves questions like, do I need nationally representative sample or demographic quotas based on some other criteria or with other words, am I inviting the right respondents to my survey to begin with? So we are all aware of the impact of a long surveys on respondent burden and engagement. Typically after the first 10 to 15 minutes, most respondents start to, to uh, disengage or even drop off from the survey. In addition, on average, um, about 50% of all online surveys are completed on smartphones. So extreme scrolling uh, is as unpleasant for survey participants as extreme paging or large amount of open-ended questions. Um, also, assuring respondents are presented with an adequate uh, list of response options is another important aspect of the survey experience. Uh, response options like um, don't know, not sure, or none of the above, none of these could be actually very uh, legitimate answers uh, when a respondent doesn't know really, or can only think of an answer and that is not provided. Not having an um, adequate response option to select forces survey participants to select inaccurate answers or um, uh, although they actually didn't have intention to provide incorrect information. Ultimately, um, respondent burden and experience impacts data quality because of their potential to increase measurement error, attrition in panel surveys, um, as well as survey non-response or non-response bias. Wonderful. Those are all really good points. And I know, Stephanie, from your point of view as a researcher, um, how does data quality affect your design and your experiences? Sure. And I think, Rosie, you hit upon this a little bit at the kind of at the top of what you were talking about. But when I think about data quality, the first place and not the only place, but definitely the first place that my mind always goes is to survey design. 
because that's where quality starts. You know, it goes back to that old adage, junk in, junk out. So I try to think about, are the research questions an accurate reflection of the business objectives? Do the survey questions accurately address the research questions? Are we measuring what we intend to measure? And I think sometimes there's this assumption that this is the easy part. You know, we've all taken surveys. And so I think to some extent, we feel like we can probably write surveys. And I, I think there is some truth to that, but I also think that there's a skill set there. And so part of what we really try to do and to focus on here is to make sure, and, and that is a big goal for me personally, is to really guide clients through this part of the research process, whether I'm doing it for them in a full service capacity or whether I'm advising somebody who's doing DIY research, uh, building that skill set and that confidence around survey design, because that's going to be that just that very first step. And if you don't get that right, it almost doesn't matter if you get the rest of it right. Excellent point. And I like the part about intent, really understanding what your you know ultimate goal is of the survey. Um, and so, Lev, you're deeply involved in data quality initiatives. What is your industry perspective around this buzz topic of methods and sampling? Well, uh, our industry is quite diverse and complex uh, in the in the sense that uh, companies are specializing tend to specialize on a particular portion of the equation. There are panel companies, there are technology companies, there are full service companies. And that creates, uh, that allows us to focus on various parts of the equation, but it also creates the breaks in uh, the uh, areas of responsibility. And for the past 10 years, I hear over and over the complaints and issues that, that are happening in between those areas of responsibility. For example, uh, a purely technology company who is uh, running uh, surveys day in and day out, they are focused on making sure that the technology that they're provided is very flexible and covering uh, all the requirements of their clients, but uh, they don't have direct relationship with respondents. So uh, if uh, a researcher comes to the platform and creates a bad experience, it's kind of not their fault, right? It's the fault of someone who's using the platform. And uh, a similar dynamic we see with uh, large and great panels uh, are focusing on uh, delivering opinions of uh, respondents, but uh, the survey creation is out of their hands, right? It's with uh, th that part of the equation is with the clients and researchers who are helping them. Uh, and I think that uh, we have a unique advantage uh, from the day one when we started to uh, being responsible and uh, fully aware of all the important parts of this flow, of the cycle, uh, since uh, AYTM has both a technology component and uh, the relation, direct relationship with panelists and the uh, research component, we incorporated uh, all those flows and uh, data checks in, into the full cycle, which is, uh, I think, is important for, uh, for anyone to at least think through, but it's much, help, much easier to solve uh, when you have direct access to all the components. Excellent. Wonderful. Anything else that you guys would like to add there around um, the, the sample and methodology topic? Great. Well, um, yeah, that was really helpful. And right um, in line with sample and methodology, the next most common um, trend and hot topic, buzz topic that people were interested in was um, more around technology and where we're going. It was kind of twofold. We had artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as automation and digital transformation. So first off, you know, we're all looking for relevancy and how to take action. And that's where it seemed to align where those artificial intelligence, the AI and machine learning topics came up. Lev, what are those terms when you hear that? What does that mean to you? And how do you feel like that's affecting the industry? Well, uh, in my opinion, artificial intelligence uh, is uh, in, in front of us and uh, in, in front of our eyes in the past uh, five, seven years. Uh, morphed from a fancy uh, buzzword that uh, was really oversold in PowerPoints uh, of, of yeah. different companies. Uh, it morphed into something that we're using without even recognizing it. Every time I'm asking Siri to do something for me, there is a, an AI running behind the scenes uh, interpreting my request. And I believe that uh, as we continue improving the technology uh, to, to get stuff done faster, cheaper, and better, 
uh, artificial intelligence will be one of the technologies running behind the scenes to help us uh, fulfill that promise. I'm thinking about uh, research automation as a larger term that uh, solves uh, larger problems, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the scope and the, the uh, uh, list of things that uh, researchers are doing day in and day out can really be shortened or uh, uh, be completed more efficiently if you're leveraging the uh, technology on all the parts, right? On data collection, uh, targeting, profiling, on survey creation and data analysis. And uh, there, uh, again, our uh, industry is offering different solutions to this problem. Some solutions are purely technical. Uh, you can uh, log into a, a platform and figure it out and uh, get your results done. Uh, other solutions are human driven. And I encourage to look for partners who uh, have flexibility to solve the particular uh, needs of, of, of a client that can adopt and provide more support or less support uh, that have the automation baked into the flows and uh, different components of what they offer. Wonderful. Yeah. And you, we started with artificial intelligence. And like you said, it's all encompassing and it goes right into automation. I know a lot of our clients that we talk to, it's always, you know, challenge people that talk to you about automation and trans digital transformation to what does that mean to them? Um, is it just a technology or is it really a true scalable platform? Like is something I know that we approach it as. Um, so automation and digital transformation is a section of the GRIT report that AYTM actually provided some commentary on because that's where our expertise has been for the last 10 years, which I can't believe it's been that long. Um, and so Stephanie, I know you're using automation day to day. Um, can you share a little bit about how that impacts both automation and digital transformation into your world? Yeah, no, I definitely can. And before I do that, I do want to say that I think that I, one of the best things that we can offer our clients is that flexible service model because it's about meeting people where they're at and what and and where they need automation. So I love that so much. But speaking as a researcher myself to answer the rest of this question, what I would say is that the best thing about automation is that it frees up the researcher to focus on the parts of research that truly require a skilled researcher's touch. I would so much rather be spending my time thinking about the best way to operationalize my test attributes for a conjoint experiment than be creating a design sheet and programming a conjoint study and running the analysis to estimate the utilities. If I can be confident that the automation in those areas is good and is tight and is well done, then that frees me up to focus on the upfront stuff. And then again, to, to get into the insights and to really dig into what, do, what do the data mean when it gets in? And so instead of being focused on the really laborious parts of uh, research execution, I can be focused on the consultation and the insights, which are the part that really requires, you know, that researcher skill set and touch. That's awesome. I think it's nice to have time to be strategic, right? And not always be reactive. We can be proactive as researchers. And um, I know we've seen that programs that customers that have already implemented or are implementing digital, digital transformation um, are being more agile, they're being more iterative, and they really have a home field advantage right now. So Lev, how would you describe digital transformation and what you're seeing you know, across the industry? Well, I think that our industry is uh, crossing a chasm that uh, other industries uh, have already crossed, like marketing industry, our neighbors and friends. Uh, marketers uh, are uh, quite uh, ahead of us in terms of uh, adopting new technology and uh, uh, learning quickly new technologies. Uh, so I'm thinking about uh, this as a journey uh, across uh, bridges that various companies are, are building uh, to get people into the comfort of using technologies of various sorts uh, to advance their abilities to draw uh, high quality insights. And uh, our company sees it as, a, as our mission to help uh, various uh, CPG and consumer brands uh, companies to transform the flows and the, the ways they are approach market research uh, to something that would enable them to do uh, uh, things faster, to focus more attention on being strategic. Like Stephanie said, uh, to let machines do what machines do better than us and faster and actually with fewer mistakes. 
uh, and uh, be humans, right? Be smart uh, and the, the indispensable mm -hmm. uh, strategic leaders that we are uh, to better advise uh, the direction of the organization. Wonderful, thank you. And I uh, totally agree with that. And I like the journey, meeting people, and Stephanie, you said that as well, You know, meeting customers where they're at versus trying to force them into um, a set environment, that's great. Um, so we've talked about the top topics, the top topics in the um, buzz uh, topics section, but um, let's round that out with another area that takes us a little bit further into areas of expertise and learnings. Um, we're in market research and insights, so we're naturally curious. <laughs> as are all of our clients. And um, we wanna talk a little bit about how that specific expertise and um, different types of tools can translate into differentiated reports, content, and just a more proactive environment. Um, so Stephanie, your team I know has been running a consumer tracker for the last 11 weeks um, to help all of us understand what's happening in the world, kind of a pulse and sentiment analysis. Can you share some of those findings with us? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Uh, it's definitely true that now more than ever in our current environment, that's changing so quick at, quickly that we've noticed um, it's very evident that businesses are just hungry for knowledge and for insights right now that are relevant to their industry. And some of that they're able to run for themselves, but it's a lot to start all at once. Right. And so they're really looking to their partners in a way that I don't think has necessarily been the case in the past. Maybe for some firms, but not for more like platforms, let's say, and for other um, sorts of research companies. And so, we definitely heard okay. that from our clients. And and in answer to that, what we started with is we built our COVID tracker, and that was built specifically to address this need that I just talked about, and to cover things from general trends in social and health behavior but also to really dive into what's going on in the consumer landscape. You know, working with a lot of CPG companies and other types of businesses that are consumer facing, a lot of the questions that people had were very consumer focused. Um, so we've done a lot of work around that. And if I can talk for just a very brief moment about some of the things that we are finding, um, I think some of the most interesting work that, I've, uh, that we've been doing personally in, in terms of the data that we're seeing relates to brand switching. Um, we have been asking a lot of questions about like brand purchase and brand switching in particular across a wide swath of categories, everything from kind of home cleaning and laundry and sort of CPG type things to food, to beverage and apparel and tech, and just, you know, trying to get hit as many categories that are consumer facing as we can. And one of the things that we've learned is that there is a lot of brand switching going on. I would say a fifth to a quarter of consumers are really moving around a lot right now, um, whereas that's something that previously was quite static for people. And I think uh, the, the initial sort of uh, interpretation of that is, well, that's stock outs at the shelf, right? Like that's what's causing that. They, people aren't seeing what they normally buy, and so they're buying something else to replace what they would normally buy. That is true. Stockouts are one reason that people are switching brands. But there are actually a lot of other very specific COVID reasons that people are switching brands right now. And it's fascinating. And so just to give you like a, a little uh, window into some of that, one is um, variety. And I know this <laughs> sounds sort of silly in this environment, but what it comes down to is that people are in a very kind of rote experience right now in our day-to-day -day lives. We are stuck at home. We are not able to engage in our lives in, in a full way that we used to. And so one way that we see consumers addressing that and seeking out variety is with the kinds of products they're buying. It's really interesting. Um, we see that more in tech and toys, as an example. Um, another reason that we see people switching that is not related to stockouts at the shelf um, has to do with performance. And this is another one that to me is really interesting because um, it relates to, I think previously there was a lot of trend and movement, especially in CPG, to more natural products. Um, and especially with cleaning and laundry and things like that, uh, surface care. What we're seeing is that a lot of that people who may have been shifting to a more natural mindset, as soon as uh, a global pandemic happened, some of that mindset began switching back to a performance oriented product preference. So natural is great, but if I need to kill germs, then maybe I need to go back to something a little bit harsher, something that kills bacteria, et cetera. So we're seeing some switching in that area. And then finally, another really interesting one that I would note um, just relates to the fact that we are in an economic, um, 
you know, downturn right now. And so certainly there are a lot of people who are switching brands strictly because it is an economic necessary to find a brand that is more cost effective, that's a value brand in place of maybe a more performance oriented or premium brand that they were purchasing purchasing earlier. And so looking at all of that across a lot of different categories and seeing distinctions and differences and, and seeing what drives those differences has been a really fascinating exercise that I know has been really useful to some of our clients. And, and we're really looking forward to continuing to partner and support our clients in that way. Wonderful. Yes. And um, I know that we're continuing to do this study as different things happen in the world. And um, that's all available on our website. And so that's been great to see the 11 weeks and the progression of that. Um, I know that um, as part of this topic, um, this buzz topic around uh, tools as well as learnings, um, I know, Lev, can you share your thoughts on how uh, this would relate as a buzz and industry interest topic? Uh, sure. Uh, I think that uh, as we continue improving the, uh, the processes and technologies, uh, we uh, can identify the commonly used topics that researchers are doing over and over, whether it's a, a tracker or uh, a regular concept test. Uh, identify that tech and uh, perfect it, right? And perfection uh, toward the uh, st stability of uh, a set of questions and uh, expected outcome um, uh, leads uh, many of uh, market research providers uh, to the idea of uh, uh, repeated uh, templatized uh, solutions, um, which uh, offers both uh, uh, flexibilities uh, and uh, uh, guaranteed uh, outcome. Uh, but uh, I think the, the most important uh, uh, consideration here is how rigid versus how flexible that solution is. Okay. And uh, if we're thinking about the evolution uh, of uh, market research automation, uh, it seems to, to me that uh, we're headed into uh, the future where uh, uh, more and more companies will be able to satisfy both of those uh, imperatives, the uh, uh, predictable, high quality, uh, consistent and compatible outcomes uh, without sacrificing the uh, flexibility that researchers really need uh, when they go from one study to another. Wonderful. Yeah. And I think that aligns also with what Stephanie talked about with um, just how clients have been able to use the findings from consistent testing, as well as being able to customize it to what they need. Um, so I, I think that's really important. Um, so, um, yeah, so we've talked about the really a lot of the top buzz topics today, right? We had methods and sampling, which was data quality driven um, technology, which is really about iterative and agile learnings, which is um, AYTM's sweet spot where we were able to leave, leave some commentary in the report and then rounding it out with expertise and specific tools that can make all of us across the industry better. So um, is there anything else anybody would like to add before we go um, in towards our Q&A to see if anybody has any questions for us? Okay, well, we have a lot of experts here. And um, before we move into that, please, I do want to let everybody know um, that is joining us. Number one, thank you. And uh, definitely feel free to reach out if you do want to talk a little bit more about technology or um, agile iterative testing. And we also do have um, on our website, you can contact me directly, um, Eileen Rozick on LinkedIn or through the website, um, an insights roundtable, which is a similar forum to what you're seeing today, where we bring in industry leaders from different um, areas to have a just a closed door confidential session about their struggles, their growth areas, their successes and their failures, and really what's working today, just so we can all learn from each other and continue to succeed as we move forward through the summer. Um, so uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions for us. Let's see. I don't know. Is Christine going to pop back in here? Okay. Q&A. Okay, here we've got one. So um, how does, oh, this probably sounds like it's for Lev because it mentions UX. How does the UX experience of a technology tool impact respondents and overall data quality? Good question. Well, uh, uh, UX, uh, an experience in a, in a general uh, larger meaning, I think uh, takes a huge uh, portion of uh, our thinking and uh, hopefully other companies because if uh, you are frustrated with uh, just how the questions are asked, if you 
uh, are not sure how to move from one to another, how to uh, be properly exposed to the stimuli that uh, researchers are asking you to consider, um, you are going to, uh, uh, your, your brain power, your uh, frustration will inevitably result in uh, your uh, opinion that uh, you cannot express as smoothly as uh, you otherwise would. Uh, experience includes the, uh, uh, the the length of the interview. If you are answering uh, questions for 45 minutes, uh, you are not going to be uh, willing and able to provide uh, as good uh, of, of, of answers as uh, you would normally do under a shorter time frame. Uh, if your survey cripples and doesn't work on mobile devices, uh, which uh, as uh, we shared uh, and most people know is now accounts for over half of all surveys, uh, uh, therefore your, your half of your study will be compromised in terms of the quality unless it was prepared and handcrafted to uh, present itself nicely on different sizes on the screen. And it goes on and on, uh, including the promises that panel made to respondents and uh, how well those promises were kept. What's overall experience and attitude of uh, respondents toward uh, us as an industry and individual brands working in it. In my mind, it's paramount and uh, it's our Thinking about uh, uh, the, the research uh, starts and, and ends with uh, uh, empathy and experience of uh, all the participants, among which respondents uh, take uh, the key role. Excellent. Thank you, Lev. And then um, we have another question here. What type of automated testing are you seeing people do today? And have you seen it change since um, March, I guess, when everything started changing in the world? You want to jump in there, Stephanie? Do you want to share a little bit of what, may, or maybe even feedback of how you're seeing clients use the reporting we're doing, as well as other types of testing? So, is it specifically about automated testing that people are doing, like yeah. like agile, or do you mean like like our studies that are automated in particular? I guess it's unknown. You didn't ask the question. Yeah, we don't, yeah. I, I would say just what are you seeing out there? Like, it sounds like testing today. What are people, you know, wanting to learn? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think there, there's always the standbys. And I think that one of the things that we've repeatedly told consumers or clients, and we have a lot of conversations about this, is what kinds of research are still research that is important and good to do during this time versus kinds of research that you might want to hold on. And we always say things like segmentations, things that are built to last for a long time, maybe not the best time for it, but things like concept tests, pricing tests, things that are going to be relevant in the market today. And when you launch your project, you need to keep pushing through with that kind of research. But so we still see a lot of concept testing. We're still seeing a lot of pricing testing. And then the other thing that I would say we see a lot of is just trying to get a deeper understanding of how consumer behavior is changing right now during COVID. Um, and I know that uh, certainly clients are leaning on their partners to provide some of this information. One of the things that we see, and we're happy for this to happen, is for people to take questions from our tracker and insert them into their own studies so they can do those data cuts by their own by the questions that they have in their studies. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I think is a great use of, of working with a partner, you know, being able to take that information and say, we really like the way you asked this, we're gonna take it and put it into all of our studies now. And, and right now we're gonna get a beat on that as well in the way that we need to, so. Excellent. Wonderful. I know um, some of the things that I've seen also is, and it's been great to see like just consumer pulses, right? How are people feeling? And a lot of that in the moment research to where research can really, um, it affect our supply chain management um, to a lot of positioning and messaging and really being authentic about the creative and uh, messages that we're putting out there. And I think clients have really been able to learn a lot about that recently. So let's do our last question. Um, and this is back to the sampling, um, one of the number one buzz topics. But um, have you seen any major changes or challenges with engagement due to the recent environmental and social changes? Rosie, I think you're muted. Are you muted? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Okay. I wouldn't say um, we noticed any significant changes just because uh, um, the way people respond to our surveys is the same. Those are online surveys. And nowadays, most people um, are at home one way or another. Um, so they're actually even more available to take surveys. So 
we we didn't um, notice anything um, being different in terms of um, respondents uh, panelist behavior and opposite actually uh, we had uh, increased activity in the latest months highest since our panel exists <laughs> that's good to know thank you thank you everybody yes thank you aytm we really appreciate it. it was a great session we appreciate you all being here today uh, for folks who are in this room you might want to check out the next somebody in the next segment so go back to your agendas and click uh, join pub, uh, broadcast thank you again everyone thank you bye, bye.